Okay, so, um, yes, uh, we will, you will have a, a fifth homework assignment, and that will probably be due uh, next week. Probably I'll make it due after the final exam, okay? Um, and then we will... Uh, and next week on Monday, I will have lecture as well. Um, probably I will spend the first part talking about what's going to be on the final. And then the second part, probably not even half and half, probably just like, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes talking about the final. And then the rest of the time, I will cover uh, principal components analysis, PCA, which is uh, an important topic. Uh, and I'm just de trying, I'm debating how much PCA should be put on the final, you know? So, um, uh, probably I will decide not too much, okay? Not too much PCA on the final. Maybe just like a general conceptual, like what's the idea of PCA? And then I'll have a... Uh, like an optional, if you want to learn PCA on your own and understand the details, I'll have like a, not even, I don't even want to do extra credit, okay? It's just going to be an optional thing that exists that you can look at, but mm -hmm. if you do it or if you don't do it, uh, it, it's not going to factor into your grade for this class, okay? That probably means no one's going to do it. Maybe like two students are going to do it, but you know what? Those two students who want to learn the intricacies of PCA, good for you. And uh, and it will be great. And I'm happy to answer, you know, you can come to office hours and ask questions about PCA, and I'm happy to do all of that. But, you know, it's it's summer, and so we have to chop a little bit of stuff. Yeah, another question back there, Yoni? What's that? No, I haven't. I haven't talked about it yet. So we'll talk about... I will talk about what PCA is on Monday, okay? And at least from a high-level perspective, and probably uh, you'll be expected to understand PCA at least like what it's supposed to do, um, like conceptually for the final. I might have a conceptual question about PCA, and then um, and then I'll get into the mechanics and the uh, computation. Uh, aspects of PCA, but I probably will not. Well, I, I'll just make the decision now. I won't. I won't put those um, computational type questions on the on the final for PCA. Okay, principal components analysis. Yeah, Greece. Um, you talked about kernel functions in the last lecture. Yes. How much do you need to know for the conceptual part of it for the final? Um, I I think it's a fair topic to include on an exam. And I'll talk more about kernel functions today as well. OK. OK, so, uh, so today what I'm hoping to cover is uh, kernelized k-means clustering. So last week we covered k-means clustering. And, uh, and so today I'll cover the kernelized version of k-means clustering, uh, much like we covered um, SVM and then the kernelized version. So SVM, you just draw kind of a straight line and you maximize that margin, that uh, the width of the, the road. Um, and then if you, you also have the ability to project it into a higher dimension where you can draw a plane to separate it. Okay? Um, and, and something similar exists for clustering. And we'll call, we call that kernelized clustering. And then I will also get into the EM algorithm today, um, the expectation maximization algorithm. Have you guys heard of that, the EM algorithm? OK. It's, uh, it's exciting, all right? <laughs> it's kind of EM, the EM algorithm is kind of like k-means clustering meets Bayes classifier, OK? And it's, uh, it's pretty cool. All right, I think, OK. Well, let's, uh, let's do this kernelized K means clustering business, okay? Let's see. 
Let me resize this. How's everybody doing, by the way? It's September. September 4th. We didn't meet on Monday because you guys had Labor Day off to celebrate the uh, the worker. What? Isn't that... That's what it's for. <laughs> okay, so we had... Uh, so we had lit yet. So did you do anything on Labor Day? It's like the unofficial end of summer. So technically the summer season goes from summer solstice to not vernal. What's the other one? Something equinox. You guys. September 21. So June 21 to September 21 is the official summer season by the space. But um but I don't know. In America, it's kind of like Memorial Day to Labor Day is the start and end of, of summer. But uh, OK, anyway, you guys are laughing. Well, <laughs> um, all right. Well, I hope you enjoyed your Labor Day. I did. I didn't do much. I slept. And it's like the best, right? OK. Uh, all right, so what did I say? K-means clustering with kernels. OK, so um, let's just, this is a quick, quick, quick review of k-means clustering. Um, and we said, you know, you start off with deciding how many clusters you want, you're going to randomly assign your points, and then you calculate the centroids, you reassign based on which centroid is closest, and then you go back and forth. Random, uh, reassign, calculate the nearest centroid, reassign, calculate the distance to centroids, okay? So here is, we start off with random assignments. Based on the random assignments, these are the locations of the three centroids, okay? And then so we ask which centroid is the closest? So you look at this, these dots over here, the black centroid is the closest. You look at these dots over here, the red dot is the closest. And uh, now it's, it's not quite sure, but the computer can figure out which one is the closest, okay? And when we do that, uh, pretty much everything gets assigned to red and black and like these three points are closest to green, um, and, and that's that, okay? So we uh, reassign based on the nearest centroid, and then once we do that, we recalculate the centroids, okay? And so this is the center of all the black points, this is the center of all the red points, and then this is the center of the three green points that we have. And then now that we've reassigned these things, we ask, okay, which centroid is the closest, okay? And so, um, so green's going to pick up a few more, all right? And, uh, and we get these, okay? And then so these are the centroids that's closest. We reassign. It goes like this. We, um, we now ask which one's going to be, which, or we recalculate the centroids, and then we ask which centroid is closest. And so green's going to pick up a few more. Um, red's going to probably pick up a few more here, and black's going to lose a few, and red's going to lose a few here, okay? Um, and so that's what we get. We recalculate the centroids, and then we reassign points. Recalculate, reassign, and then uh, and you can see oop, at this point the uh, there's no changes between when we reassign points to the nearest centroid, and that's the point. That's when we say it has converged. Okay, so it's kind of neat, right? So it goes like this, and and you can see it converge that way. Okay. So that's k-means clustering. That was a quick review. And so now we will talk about kernelized k-means clustering, OK? So again, this is the idea of a kernel function. And it's an inner product, OK? And we say it's the inner product of some phi transformation of our vector, right? So uh, we saw this happen when we did the support vector machines, we took uh, data that was in two dimensions, and then we applied a kernel func uh, a transformation function, sorry, not a kernel function, a transformation function that transformed the point in 2D into 3D. And once we transformed it into 3D, we were able to draw uh, a plane to separate the, the different classes. Yeah, question. Like the one that Yes. The one that projects infinite dimensions 
what do those axons become? I, I know you might not know all of them. Right. So, so uh, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a decent question. I, it, let me look at the Taylor expansion. Oh, oh no, I already told you. Sorry. Expansion yeah. of the ex exponential function. Okay. Okay, well, I don't have the internet, so I can't tell you. Okay, but basically it's an infinite series, right? The Taylor expansion is an infinite series, and basically each of those pieces uh, become a component, okay? And so that when you have an inner product, you're multiplying them and adding them up, okay? So that's, that's basically what we're doing, okay? So, so there's some kind of function, and so if you use the uh, radial kernel, or the Gaussian kernel, which is radial and Gaussian kernel are the same basic thing. Um, you, this phi function transforms x into some infinitely long vector. But then when you take the inner product of the two vectors, it becomes a scalar. Okay, So, so even though we uh, uh, don't know what the phi transformation is, we can still take the inner product and get back a scalar. Okay, um, the linear kernel phi is not the the function phi is the identity function, so so it doesn't do anything, and the inner product just ends up being this inner product here. Okay, but you know we've had other things, and we saw this phi transformation where it went from the result of putting in a two-dimensional object into phi became a three-dimensional object. Okay, and if I took the inner product of this applied to point A and point B, okay, it would look like this, xA1, xA2, and then xA1 squared plus xA2 squared, and xB1 and xB2, and blah, 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 blah. And if we take the inner product of this, this is equivalent to having um, uh, xA dotted with xB and the uh, norm, of x a squared times the norm of x b squared, and so this kernel function, okay, this is equivalent to applying this transformation and taking the inner product of the inner transformation. Yeah. Inner product just means Yes, yes. It just means take do uh, element wise multiplication down the vector. Okay, you have two vectors of equal length. You do element wise multiplication, and then you add everything up together. Okay. That's, that's going to be your dot product. OK, uh, here's other kernel functions. OK, um, so if this is known as the uh, polynomial kernel, um, and it in includes some kind of OK, some, something's going on. My mic's glitching out. Can you guys just hear me OK? OK. Um, so we have a, a polynomial kernel. And uh, and basically, it transforms. Um, y there's different ones. Uh, but if you use c is 0 and gamma is 2, then it goes from 2d to 3d. If you have something else, then this thing becomes like much longer. Like if, if gamma is 3 and c is 1 or something, then <laughs> then this thing ends up having like seven elements or nine elements, like a bunch of elements in it, okay? So I didn't want to bother doing it, all right? But, but we could do this, and, um, and we can see that indeed if I transform this into this and I take the dot product, um, we indeed get uh, xA, xB transpose. Uh, I'm sorry, xA transpose xB, okay? So matrix multiplication, this quantity squared, okay? So you can kind of see that right there. And you can kind of check all of this and stuff. But basically, the idea is um, applying the kernel function is equivalent to running a transformation and then doing the dot product of the transformation. Okay, and we can skip all of the in between steps and get just use the kernel function directly. Okay. Okay, and then the Gaussian kernel again is this. Uh, and it, this is technically a result of it transformation going to infinite dimensions, but then you're taking the dot product, which turns it back into a scalar. Okay.
So again, here we're the again the idea there is a dot product is ultimately the sum, and uh, and so the exponential function can be approx not approximated but can be expressed as an infinite sum the the Taylor expansion. Okay, so um, because of this, we don't actually even need to worry about what this transformation function is. So when we use the radial basis function, we don't, or basis kernel, we don't need to actually know what that phi transformation function is, which puts it into infinite dimensions. It just does, okay? And that's, this is, this, when I was learning kernel functions, this was the most frustrating aspect for me, is that I always wanted to know what this phi function was. What what was this transformation function? I didn't like that it was. It's like you put in something here and you get something out, not knowing what happened in between. Okay, so so I liked these things where I could actually see what these things were. I didn't like this Gaussian kernel because I didn't know what that phi function is, but I'm okay with it now. All right, I've made my piece. Okay, um, but um, here's the other thing. Okay is that if you have a kernel function, you can actually um, calculate distances in terms of kernel functions without needing to know what the tr transformation is, okay? So, uh, but before we get into that, let's just look at like, if we have some point and we wanna know its distance to the center, okay? So I have some point x, and there's a uh, centroid mu sub k. So centroid of cluster k is mu sub k. You know, the distance is basically x minus mu transpose x minus mu, right? This is equivalent to uh, each element x minus x1 minus, you know, x whatever squared plus this minus this squared plus this minus this squared, right? So, so we can express that. So we have this distance thing which is technically uh, a, uh, this, you can also say this is the inner product of these two things, because it's the this times this element-wise added up, okay, that's what this does, okay? And then the centroid itself is calculated as the uh, sum of the x's, but you multiply it by z, right? And remember, z is either zero or one, and it's zero if the point is not in the centroid, so it doesn't get added in there. And it's a one if the point is in the centroid. Okay, so this ends up just being the average of the points that belong to the centroid, the average of the x points that are in the centroid. All right. Is that all right? Okay, so z is this matrix. Basically, each column is zeros or ones, depending on whether the x point is in the centroid or not. And so, um, so this looks really messy, okay? It looks messy, but it's not so bad, all right? Um, so here, I, basically I'm just expanding this out. Here's x, we're subtracting off the, the centroid, transpose times x minus the centroid. So I replaced x with this, and I replaced the centroid with this, right? So this is the distance, okay? And then if I just expand all of this out, it all combines to this, okay? And so here I've got the inner product of x, x and x, so x transpose x, and then I've got this thing, which is, you know, you take your z matrix, x transpose x, and, and this is, um, uh, we've got some different, uh, so remember this is the distance from point n to the centroid of cluster k. Okay, point n to the centroid of cluster k. So here I'm looking at point n, okay, so this is xn, all right, and here this is going to be the, this doesn't really have an interpretation, but um, this centroid k, the centroid k goes across, uh, is basically the, you know, the sum of all of these things. So, so here I'm, it's going to calculate xn to some, basically every other point in the data set, and um, that's what we have, and then here it just kind of, it's the cross product of basically every point to every other point, and this is how we end up calculating the centroids, okay? So the, the subscripts here are a little bit um, tough to deal with. Um, but, uh, you know, these, um, and in this step, I combine this and this, 
together because they they are exactly the same here. These this thing and this thing are ex gonna end up being the same because this is n to every other point and n to every other point. Okay. Well, anyway, if you're okay with this, and and don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to do this, but this is just to say that this works. We, we can move on here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> the, we can skip all of this, and I can just say this is the result, OK? But if you wanted to, go back in your own time and review the notes and make sure I'm not just making stuff up, you could, OK? And you can check all of this and, and check all the subscripts, and, and it, it'll be correct, right? But it, you know, sometimes you're just like, ah, just get to the answer, right? Like, just tell me what, what use this is. OK. so. So the previous page, we end end up with this thing, and that's what I have at the top, okay? And here, I'm going to replace all of these inner products with the kernel function, which itself is an inner product, right? It's just an inner product of, of something after I've transformed the x, okay? So now, I have a way to calculate distances using kernel functions without needing to actually calculate the distance, okay? <clears throat> In terms of, so normally to get the Euclidean distance, I take this point and this point, and I do like the x, you know, dimension 1, this minus this squared, dimension 2, this minus this squared, plus dimension 3, this minus this squared. And then I add all of those up and I get the distance. <clears throat> now I have a way to do that, okay, using the kernel functions. And keep in mind, this is the distance from some point n to the centroid of cluster k. And how did I get the centroid of cluster k? The old fashioned way was, a <coughs> excuse me, the old fashioned way was I had to figure out which points belong to cluster k, and then I sum those, you know, I sum up you know, dimension one, take the average, take sum of dimension two, divide by however many, take the average, and I had to do that. I don't even have to do that here, okay? This is the distance from point n to centroid of cluster k without having to actually calculate the centroid, okay? That's why we went through this crazy slide, okay, which I just kind of skimmed over. Yeah, question. So what is, so the computer knows what the k is? Well, k is just some arbitrary label, right? We've got, we're going to say we've got three clusters, so I'm going to have three different centroids, okay? If I've got three, there's three different centroids. So, so this might be, so you have some point, point one, what is it to the centroid, <coughs> centroid of cluster A, the, the red centroid? And what is the distance to the black centroid? And what's the distance to the green centroid? That's what this is, okay? Um, from point one to the red centroid, black centroid, green centroid. Point two to the red centroid, black centroid, green centroid. The amazing thing is, I don't even know where this red centroid is, where the black centroid is, or where the green centroid is. So can you ever do this by hand? You can. It's going to be a pain in the butt because you've got this double summation, but it can be done. It can be done. Okay. You don't yeah. You, you, no, it, well, you you might, you got to pick a k. You got to say, I want to find it to the red centroid, which might be k is 2, okay? Um, but you don't even know where that location is. Yoni. So what is n bar standing These are just placeholders to say we need to sum up across every single point in n, every all n points, okay? Um, Except we don't want we don't want to just use n because n is the particular point that I'm looking at. This is this is the distance from point n to the centroid of cluster k. So it might be the distance from the first point in my data set to the red centroid. Okay, and then in order to do that, I need to sum, do a summation across all of my data points. But I don't want to mix that up with like taking each n. So I just have a placeholder. It's just some arbitrary label. And we're going to go from m is equal to 1 to n. 
and I also do from m equals 1 to n and r going from 1 to n. But it's just it's just to say, like, you're going to go from this to this point um, and everything. Yeah. No, it's, they're not n. They're not n. They are just placeholders to say you need to sum from some arbitrary across all the points in your data set without mixing it up with um, with a thing, right? Like it's it's just like if you have a double integral, you don't use the same letter. You don't use x and x. You say you know the summation across all t and the summation across all z or something, right? You use you change the letters each time you have to do a summation. Yeah, the, the letter, they don't have meaning. They're just uh, summations to say you're going to sum across all possible values in, in your data set. OK. Yeah. OK, so th w this, I mean, it's a good question. Th this is, uh, you know, we've got to go from every point to every other point, OK? One, e every point in R, from R to every point in M, and then from, uh, you know, every, this, this is going to be um, across all points there, OK? So anyway, let me just kind of show what this what this does okay so this is the exact same thing um, and we're going to uh, basically when we it's the same thing as k-means clustering except the way we calculate the distance to the centroids is using the kernel functions okay and so uh, so here's here's an example okay and I'm gonna do this the old I don't know, the kind of the classical way that we might be able to picture easily by actually doing the transformation. And I'm going to use the Euclidean distance to calculate the distance. Okay, so I'm going to do it the kind of this standard way first. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know what <clears throat> uh, what's going on here. All right, so here I've got eight data points, and it looks like this, okay? And we want to cluster these, okay? If we use traditional k-means clustering, it's not. It's going to have a hard time because traditional k-means clustering uses Euclidean distance um, to measure similarity, right? And so um, it might cluster these together, but it's also going to cluster all of these like on the outside into the same cluster as this. We're not going to be able to work because this thing is super far away from this, right? There's no distance in our data set that's farther from here to here, okay? And so Euclidean distance says these two points are very, very different, OK? And so they, they would never actually put them in the same cluster, OK? But there's something in our heart that says, I think the ones in the middle are more similar and the ones at the perimeter are more similar, right? There's something that kind of wants us to do that way. So Euclidean distance is not the best way because the Euclidean distance will say, no, that these two points on the perimeter are as different as they get because their distance is super far. Okay, so the Euclidean distance, regular old k-means clustering, will never put these two in the same thing. So what I do is I apply the transformation, right? So that here is if I, I'm going to use this phi transformation, which puts in a third coordinate, which is x1 squared and x2 squared. So all of those points, which were two-dimensional, now has a, a third dimension, okay? And this is that third dimension. And here I just start off with random assignments. I randomly assign each point to <clears throat> assignment one or two, okay? So I randomly assign them, and these are my initial random assignments. And so if I color them with the initial random assignments, you'll see that five points get assigned to cluster two and three points get assigned to cluster one, okay? And so in three dimensions, this is what it looks like. These three points, these three are assigned to <clears throat> the red cluster, and so are these, these two in the middle. And these two in the middle are in the blue cluster along with this point out here. OK? And so this is, I've done the transformation. And after I've done the transformation, I'm going to calculate the mean of the red cluster and the mean or the centroid of the blue cluster. Okay. And so if I do that, 
all I have to do is I just basically say, okay, um, these three points are assigned to cluster one, so I'm going to do point two plus point two plus eight, 8.04, and I divide by three, and then I get point one and negative point one, which is zero, and I add two, and I have a sum of two, and I divide, I'm sorry, yeah, two, and I divide by three, and I get point six six, and then this one, uh, point one minus point one and minus two point two, and I get negative point six six. Okay, and so so that's what I get. So the centroid of cluster one is negative point six six, positive point six six, and two point six eight, which is eight point zero four divided by three. And then the same thing with the uh, the other cluster where I have uh, five points assigned to it. Okay, and I get the centroid. And so this is the centroid uh, of cluster uh, the red cluster and the black. A blue cluster and um, and it's hard to see but this is where they they exist in three dimensions and now I'm going to find okay what is the distance from this point to this centroid and what's the distance from this point to this centroid and then we're gonna find the distance from each point to the two centroids and then we're gonna assign it based on which centroid is closer right so here are um, here are the two centroids, okay? And uh, and then I go, okay, so here's this point. I'm going to do, you know, this minus this squared plus this minus this squared plus this minus this squared. And then I get the distance to centroid A. I do 0.1 to this squared, 0.1 to this thing squared, and 0.02 to this thing squared. And then I add that up, and I get the distance to centroid B, okay? And so I say 7.9 is smaller than 23.26. So based on that, it's going to get assigned to the first centroid. I go to the next point, and I go, OK, which distance to this centroid, and then this point to this centroid. This distance is 8.2. This distance is 23.1. This one is smaller. It gets assigned to cluster 1. Is that right? And I do this for all eight data points. And when I get over to here, and I say, what's the distance to this centroid up top? And I get 37. What's the distance to this centroid uh, down here? and it's 18.5, so it's going to get assigned to cluster 2 because that has the smaller distance. Okay, and um, so I get the first four going to cluster 1, the second four going to cluster 2, and then uh, so this is the assignments. I recalculate the centroids, okay, and the centroid of cluster 1 is 0, 0, 0, 0. 0.02, the centroid of cluster 2 is 0, 0, 0.8.0, and, uh, and if I recalculate the distances, now we see it's very close to the centroid of cluster A, and over here it's uh, a, um, very far from the centroid of cluster B, far from the centroid of cluster A, but close to the centroid of cluster B. And so we see that none of the assignments change. We still remain um, first four in cluster A and the second four in cluster B. So no assignments have changed, therefore it has converged, and we are done. Is that all right? So, so here, this was kind of the traditional method. I gave you the fit transformation function. We transformed it to the higher dimension. Then we calculated the centroids by taking averages. And then we calculated distances to those centroids. And if you had to do this manually, you could. It might be a little tedious, but it, it would be possible, right? Like you would just take this distance, this minus this squared, this minus this squared, and this minus this squared, right? And you would add that up. Right? So it's possible if you saw something like this on a test and I said calculate the distances to these centroids, right? That that's a, a feasible question. Hint. Okay. Um, so we have that. All right. Now I'm going to do the same thing. Okay. So look at these numbers on slide 36, okay? I don't expect you to memorize them. But I'm going to calculate these things without having to figure out the third dimension and without having to figure out the centroids uh, and do that, OK? And I'm going to basically just use this kernel function. So I have the equivalent kernel. So th the transformation to three dimensions is equivalent to using this kernel. And by using this kernel, I can figure out the distance from point n to the centroid of cluster K by using this thing, OK? This is a little bit of a pain to, to compute, OK? Um, but this is what we have. So we start off 
this is our this is our data in two dimensions only along with their assignments okay so we have the, the data in two dimensions only and along with their assignments and then I turn this into um, basically zeros and ones to get our Z's because that's what I need Z's to uh, to do here and um, and I'm going to calculate these distances here okay and so um, so first uh, I'm going to get this part, um, the M and the R. So X, M, transpose, you know, R. So anyway, all of this, uh, this is what we have, because I'm just doing this. X, A, so the kernel, which is M, M and R here, um, I'm going to do X, um, X mul multiplied by X, B, okay, for point M and point R. And then um, the norm of X squared and the norm of uh, X, V squared. Okay, so this is going to kind of give me a kernel matrix, and it's this is the point, the kernel distance or the kernel function for every point crossed with every other point. Okay, doesn't that doesn't matter? But anyway, I'm going to just calculate these sums. Okay, so I get the double sum and all of this, and don't worry about this. Okay, again, you can go and review all of this. But the point is, the point is, is that I've calculated the distances from point one to the centroid of cluster A without actually calculating the centroid of cluster A. And I've calculated the distances from each point to the centroid of cluster B without actually calculating the centroid of cluster B, without doing the actual transformation using the phi function. And so if I, these are the results, if I bind them together, and if I flip back to slide 36, we can see the distances are exactly the same, All right? So the important thing here is I've used this kernelized distance function, which gives me the exact same results that I got where I had to do go through the transformation and calculate the centroid. And I'm getting the same results using just this, okay? Now I know just this is quite complex, but, um, and maybe as far as our brains work, it's easier to think of the transformation and calculating the centroid, okay? That's probably easier for our brains to grasp because the kernel functions are still a, feel a little bit weird and a mystery. And it's okay. We can just trust, okay, and again, because the math works out and all of that, we can trust that these distances calculated this way will be accurate, okay? And that's what this slide is trying to show. It's trying to show that we got the same numbers even though I didn't use the phi transformation function to, trans to transform it into three dimensions, and even though I didn't actually calculate the centroid itself, which seems so weird, right? We're like, I'm talking about the distance from this point to the center of some other point, but I don't even know where that center is, okay? It seems so weird that it can be done, but it can be done, okay, um, with, with the kernel functions. Um, and, and this is going to be essential if we want to do something like the radial basis function because the radial basis function, that transformation function, goes from 2D into infinite D, okay? And so it's not physically possible on a, on a computer to calculate the actual transformation, which is going to be infinitely long, and then um, calculate the centroid, which is going to be a centroid that exists in infinite dimensions. So that's phys not physically possible. But we can get the distances still to this infinitely infinite dimensional centroid, which again, we can't picture, we don't even actually know where it is, but we can still cal calculate the distance to it. Yeah? What you keep saying is true, the function you're using has the kernel, and the kernel is already a projection. Even if you're not projecting, you're basically projecting already by using the kernel like three times. Yeah, so I'm, I'm basically, I'm. that's what I'm just saying. I'm just saying that we are able to do this without, we're able to calculate a distance to an unknown point which I think, which to me is a strange idea, that we don't even know where the location of one endpoint is, 
but yet we are able to calculate it based on the other data that exists. Okay. Um, the closest thing I can draw an analogy to is, is if you were trying to cluster like people, like let's say we're tr going to try to cluster celebrities together or something like that, right? And, um, and I could give you, I don't know, um, the names of like some actors or something, and we could say, uh, I don't know who, who's going to be so like so we can say like, um, uh, so there's like Chris Hemsworth and Liam Hemsworth and uh, whatever Chris Evans and Chris Pratt. And are there any other Chris's? But anyway, right? So you have all of these these people, okay? And then we can ask, like, uh, okay, so here's a new actor that's coming along, and and we might have the the cluster of Chris's, and we might have uh, I don't know who's who's like the um, oh, I, don't, I don't know like some other celebrities that are maybe um, like the uh, the guy who on Silicon Valley. <laughs> and uh, like Joseph Gordon-Levitt and stuff like these kind of the, the people that play not like the superhero but more of like these quote beta males do you know what I'm talking about anyway right and we can bring in some some actor and we can say like is it is this person going to be more similar to this cluster or this cluster and we don't know what the centroid of this cluster is right it's some fictitious character that doesn't quite exist in the real world we, we can't quite do this the average of something but but we can based on the similarity this point is to every other point that belongs to the cluster and this person is to every other person in this cluster we can say okay this one's going to be more similar to this than than this other thing okay even though we don't physically know what the centroid is of all of these actors and celebrities are or something that's the close uh, that's kind of an analogy i can give where it's like you can still calculate and say this centroid is closer even though you don't actually know what the centroid is by knowing the distance to the other points. Okay, um, so, so it's going to work and we can figure out which column is the minimum, right? So, uh, do you guys know about which.min? Yeah, it's a useful function when you're doing like k-means, right? Because you need to assign it to which, to the cluster that has the shortest distance, and so you just uh, you just say, well, which column is the minimum? Oh, column one, column two, right? So it's apply which min. All right, I'm giving you the answers right here. Okay. Um, all right, here's a silly example. Okay. Here's some data points. We got some points in the middle, points on the perimeter, and um, we can do k-means clustering. Okay. If I did k-means clustering. Again, it uses Euclidean distance to say which point is the closest. And if I did that, I get something like this. Okay, it's, it's not that great, these results. So k-mean clustering, again, it fails because it says, um, you know, these points are really far away from these points, so there's no <laughs> way I'm going to put these two, the points up here in the same cluster as the points down here. Okay. Um, if I wanted to do a uh, kernelized k-means, it can be done. I start off with random assignments. And here, um, <coughs> I'm going to use the uh, um, Gaussian kernel. Okay, I'm going to use the Gaussian kernel here. And, uh, and so when I do the Gaussian kernel, in iteration one, it does this, okay? And again, the centroid that exists cannot be pictured because it exists in infinite dimensions, okay? And um, so the first iteration, it does this. Next iteration, it does this. And then as we do more iterations, it says these ones in the middle are belong to one cluster, and these ones on the perimeter belong to another cluster, okay? Oh, yeah, here's, here's the... Uh, these are the actors I was thinking of. Okay, Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Jason Momoa. So these are like big, uh, muscular uh, action movie stars, right? 
I have no problem showing their uh, bodies off, right? Okay. And then we got Jesse, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Jesse Eisenberg, Adam Scott, and they're typically, um, I don't know, I don't know what roles they play, but they, uh, um, they play different kinds of characters, right? And then, uh, and the, so you have Martin Freeman. He is, uh, he's that British guy that plays uh, Watson in Sherlock, and um, I don't know. All right, so so what we can say is like, which cluster does he belong to? Again, we would, we don't know where the centroid of these things are, but we say, all right, how similar is this guy to each of these other characters, and or each of these other people? And we say, well, he's more similar to to these ones than the other ones. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So that is kernelized k-means clustering. Is that okay? All right. Now let's do our EM algorithm. All right, so the EM algorithm, we're going to do the most basic form of the EM algorithm, which is the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixtures. This is about as, uh, the EM algorithm is technically more general and has more use cases and can do a lot more stuff, but the general form of the EM algorithm is a lot more complex, okay? So the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixtures, I think, is better or easier to, uh, to understand and teach. Um, the, it is another unsupervised learning problem, OK? And so we are trying to form kind of clusters of points that are similar to each other without anyone telling us the answers, OK? Um, so. We're going to just start off with kind of a mixture of distributions. So here I've got three distributions. These are three uh, bivariate Gaussian distributions, OK? And it's going to be a mixture of them. So I've got um, a cluster centered at 0, 0 um, with this sigma matrix, 9, 0, 0, 9. I've got another cluster centered at 4, 4 with this sigma matrix, 1.9.9. So this one has covariance. And then here's another cluster centered at negative 4, negative 4, and it's got um, this covariance, so negative covariance there. Okay? And the mixing proportions is, is that it's 50% cluster 1, 30% cluster 2, and 20% cluster 3. Okay, Or maybe not cluster, but mixture 3. Okay, So, so our data itself is a mixture, and this is what we have. Okay, so you can kind of see it. In the center, we've got this big mix um, data, okay? And then we've got data that belongs to the cluster where the center is 4, 4, and there's high covariance there. And then we've got data where the center is negative 4, negative 4, and there's negative covariance. And you can kind of see the cloud of points here, okay? But here's the problem is, is we ask, okay, is this point right here, is this part of the cluster that goes right here, or is it part of the bigger cluster that, that's centered at 0, 0? Okay? And the answer is, is we don't really know. Okay? But overall, like we could try to, like if I told you to draw clusters and color them, you'd probably color these points a certain color. You'd probably color these ones another color, and then everything else you'd color something else. right? Is, does that kind of, can you guys see that visually here? And that's, and that's what we have. We've got these three uh, mixtures, three components mixed together. And, you know, half of the data is, you know, there and, and something like that. Okay. And so this is just kind of um, generating our data here. So this is the original, if I know the answers, this is what it is. Okay. So we could see, you know, there's a lot of points in green here. But you know, like this point right here, actually belongs to the center component. Okay, it just um, because the center component has high variance, it just happens to produce a point out here. Okay. Now the EM algorithm doesn't 
know this and it's just trying to find some structure and it's going to group some points together and group some points together okay um, again if I uh, used k-means clustering we're not going to get good results because k-means clustering uses distance as a way to measure similarity all right and so it's going to just say like um, it might correctly identify something up here but it's going to just say like uh, like according to k-means clustering if this is the centroid here it says this point here is more similar to this point than this point out here right I don't know if you guys can see it so if this is the centroid right here it's going to say this point is more similar to this than this point is because the distance to this point is long and the distance to this point is shorter. Okay, so uh, Euclidean distance says this is more similar to this. Although visually, because we have an idea that the distribution looks like this ellipse, we would say visually that this one shouldn't belong to this because it's going the wrong way in the ellipse, right? And this one, these ones make more sense. So um, the EM algorithm is kind of like a blend of k means clustering along with the Bayes classifier, okay? So if you think back to the Bayes classifier, not the naive Bayes classifier, but the Bayes classifier where you're allowed to have covariance, um, when you did the Bayes classifier, you said, well, let's figure out the probability uh, that this point belongs to this component or this component or this component, right? You figured out the, the PDF, multiplied by the likelihood divided by you know the sum of everything else okay and then you did uh, and you did that for all of the different components or different classes and so the EM algorithm is like that but it's iterative it's iterative much like k-means clustering okay and so uh, again we don't have the answer so when, when you did the regular Bayes classifier you said these ones we know are classified as this and these ones are classified as this and you use the ones that you knew to get your where's the mean of cl uh, classification one and what's the sigma of classification one and you knew those these belong to cl class two and you say what's the mean of class two and what's the sigma of class two and so on and so forth here it's unsupervised and so there is this iterative process okay we're gonna say let's guess I guess these points belong to cluster one and I guess these points belong to cluster two and I guess these points belong to cluster three actually it's gonna even be it's not even like these points belong to cluster one we're gonna have probabilistic assignments this point is 90 percent cluster one 10 percent cluster two and five uh, or well 90 10 zero percent cluster three I guess okay um, and so anyway this point which is 90 percent cluster one I'm going to find all of the points that are kind of belong to cluster one, and I'm going to calculate the mean of cluster one by kind of using the weighted mean of all the points that are assigned to it. And I, and I do the same for the sigma and whatnot. Okay, so we'll we'll kind of see this, right? So yeah, uh, what point? Which cluster does this belong to? And again, it could belong to this cluster over here or it could be along to the center we don't really know right so so this is what we do right we have probabilistic assignments much like the Bayes classifier right and we call these the membership weight right and once we have the membership weights we calculate the parameters being the mean and standard deviation or Sigma uh, by using a weighted mean and weighted uh, variance covariance matrix um, uh, uh, for the uh, the points that are assigned which is really just probabilistically assigned to that cluster okay and we go back and forth between calculating reassigning the points which is really just calculating the membership weights that's the E step the in the EM algorithm there's the E step and an M step um, between calculating the membership weights the E step and recalculating the parameters being the center and the sigma matrix, the M step. So we go back and forth between those things. Does that feel okay? Maybe? Yeah. Maybe not. Okay. All right. So this part, the E step, is very much like 
the Bayes classifier. We have a likelihood times a prior divided by the marginal. Okay. So, uh, and then the marginal is just the sum of the numerators across all things. Okay. So the likelihood is the probability of getting this data point. It's the PDF, the multivariate PDF, based on the um, the weights of you know what whether it uh, um, belongs to that point or not. Okay. And then over here, the alpha is the prior, and this is kind of like how many points are assigned to the cluster right now. Okay. So I'll go through each of these things to talk about kind of the, the symbols for this. Okay. So first of all, a sub k is just how many points belong to cluster k divided by the total number of points. That makes sense. Except the weird thing is how many points belong to cluster k is not necessarily an integer. It's going to be the total of the membership weights. Okay, so if I have, let's say, I've got ten data points. Okay, and let's say point one is eighty percent cluster A, twenty percent cluster B, and then point two is eighty percent cluster A and twenty percent cluster B, and let's say all of them have this eighty twenty percent assignment. Okay, it's currently you know eighty per. So none of them are truly assigned to cluster A, and none are truly assigned to cluster B, but they're kind of weighted, okay? And so if I sum up the 80% and I sum up the 20%, then I would have eight that are assigned to cluster A and two that are assigned to cluster B. But it's not that I actually physically have eight points assigned to cluster A, and not that I actually have two points that are assigned to cluster B, it's just the weighted sum of those, it's just the sum of those weights. Yeah. For the 80 20, um, the reader probabilistically. Right, yes. So remember, the Bayes classifier returns a probability, right? The Bayes classifier doesn't say this is for sure class A or for sure class B or for sure class C. You know, it might say 99% class A, you know, 1 half percent class B, 1 half percent class C, okay? But it's a probabilistic weight. Okay, and basically you're using those probabilistic weights from the Bayes classifier to say um, this is how many points belong to cluster A, and it might be like 2.87 points belong to cluster A or something like that. Okay, and so we do that to get our priors. Okay, so it's like the kind of like the number of points, but it's not really the number of points. It's the total sum of the weights. Is that okay? Okay. So you just have to shift from counting and saying these points def for sure, but now we're going to probabilistic things, right? It's like in um, in chemistry, you have like the uh, the orbitals. <laughs> no, the probabilistic locations of the electrons. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's Sorry. like if you're gonna tell, tell me that you haven't been paying attention, I, I don't think you get to ask questions about stuff that you haven't been paying attention about. All right. So, uh, if you've been paying attention and you want to ask a question, fine. But if you haven't been paying attention, don't ask. Don't, don't ask questions, or don't tell me that you haven't been paying attention. Okay. Um, All right, so here, um, so this is, uh, so we talked about this part, the prior, okay? And then so this part, the likelihood, this is just the PDF, right? It's the PDF, but now it's the, you know, bivariate PDF. And, and luckily for us, we can just use DMV norm, right? Well, multivariate normal, and because it's the PDF, we're using the D version, right? Okay. So the D requires the point that we're looking at, x nu. And here, we need to know what x bar sub k is, right? We need to know what this, I guess it, here it's mu sub k. I called it x bar sub k, whatever. OK, and then the variance, we need to know this, right? So the, every normal distribution is defined by a mean and a variance. And so we need to know what is the mean and the variance, OK? 
So the mean is basically the weighted mean of points uh, of points assigned to that cluster, right? So we just say point the first point is, you know, 10 10, but it's 80% assigned to cluster 1, okay? So when we kind of add that in, we don't add in the point 10 10, we add 80% of 10, so we add 8 and 80% of 10, so we get 8, 8 gets added in, okay? And, and we, we average the, uh, uh, we add the weighted, basically the weighted coordinates that way, all right? Which uh, also, again, feels a little bit weird, but it shouldn't feel that weird, right? That's how your GPA works. You say, this is, uh, you know, this class was only worth one credit, and this class was worth five credits, so your, you know, your B in this class counts five times more than your A in this one credit class, right? That's how stuff like that works, right? And and basically, we're just saying this point is like 90% more likely to be, in, is like 90% class one, so it counts a lot towards the mean of class one, okay? And it's only 2% for class B, all right? Or what, you know, I'm mixing up letters and numbers, but you know, it's only 2% for the other cluster, and so, uh, so its thing only counts 2% towards it, all right? So it's just a weighted mean there to get the, to get the centroid, the mean of each cluster, all right? Yes? Sorry, what does EM stand for again? EM is expectation maximization. So, and that's because in the iterative nature, uh, there's an expectation step and a maximization step. There's it kind of like a k means you've got a you're reassigning and then you recalculate distances and reassign and recalculate distance it's kind of like that except you're recalculating probabilities and then you are uh recalculating the the centroids centroids and uh variances okay yeah yeah i'm sorry in the previous example then was your mk8 or was your mk80 percent so the NK is the sum of all the weights. So if I have 10 weights that are 0.8, then my NK would be 8. Oh. OK? But each of the weights is going to be 80% or something. So each of the weights might be like 80%. And if I have 10 of these, then the sum of them would be 8. Well, you said that the N was just all of them. N is just the total number of points. Okay. So if I, have a, if I have a total of 10 points, then 8 divided by 10 here would be 0 0.8. That's not the greatest example because I'm using the same number over and over again. But, but you, you, you add up the weights and you get a total count here and then you divide by, you, get, you, get, you add up the weights to get how many points are quote belong to cluster K and then you take that number of points and you divide by the total number of points for the kind of proportion that belong to cluster K. All right, so we get the weighted mean right here, okay? And then here, this is just the variance, but it's the weighted variance, okay? So if we do the variance, you know, it's x minus mu times x minus mu transpose, uh, 1 over n. Uh, that's fine. It's, here it's just weighted. Is that all right? And that's really all you need to know, okay? <laughs> and then you, and if you use that, <laughs> I know it sounds it sounds like a crazy jump, right? But but so but we have a, we have the way to get this, right? So so we are going to use D DMV norm, right? We're going to use the PDF, and we ha we have a way to calculate the weighted mean x bar, and we have a way to calculate the variance, right, for each cluster. And so we can get this. We plug in our new data point. It, this has a defined coordinates. We plug that in. We get a density here. Okay, that goes in the numerator, right? And we talked about how to get the alpha sub k, right? Okay. And then so we got these. And if we can do this, we do this for all of the clusters to get our denominator. Okay. And then we get probabilistic assignments, right? So so now we have a way to get new weights here. So this, that's the, basically the same as the Bayes classifier, all right? And then once we get the new weights, what do we do? We iterate again, okay? And we recalculate, we recalculate the mean, 
we recalculate the variance, we do our probability assignments again. And once we get our probability assignments again, we recalculate the mean, we recalculate the variance, we do our probability assignments again. Okay, so we just iterate between doing the probability assignments again and recalculating the mean and variance. Do the probability assignments, recalculate the mean and variance. Okay. So the clusters are not labeled. This is how we see the data. Okay. And these are the true answers. And so, uh, so here I'm going to just start off arbitrary. I'm going to just say, let's just put a center at 0, 0, a center at 9, 9, which is like way out here, and a center at negative 9, negative 9. Okay. And then here I'm going to just start off with identity covariance matrices. Or not identity, but 1, 0, 0, 1 covariance matrices. It's not correct. Doesn't matter, right? We're gonna just start off with these, right? And then I'm just starting off with around 30 30 percent of each, 33, 33, 34 percent each. So I just start off with just some arbitrary assignments. Okay. And um, uh, this picture is a little bit false, okay? Um, so here it looks like these belong to the center cluster, these belong to the, this cluster up here, and these belong to this cluster down here. But it's not that. It's a probabilistic assignment, right? So, so this one is probably like 99% cluster in the middle, okay? And these ones are 51% black, and these ones, and 49% green, and these ones here are going to be 51% green and 49% black, okay? So, um, so it's colored this way, but it's not, they're all probabilistic, okay? So each point, you know, gets a probability assignment using the Bayes classifier. And here I've just colored them according to which class is the highest. But the ones on these border, the border ones are like 51% black, 49% green. And this one over here is 51% green and 49% black, okay? I can't, I don't know how to show that here without like breaking our eyes, okay? Um, so, so it just looks this way, but it's not, it's not, a, this, this is too much like k-means clustering where you have a def, definitive assignment. It's, it's not that. It's probabilistic, right? Because the Bayes classifier always gives us a probabilistic assignment. So, so just keep that in mind here. All right, so we have this, okay? And so, based on all the points that are assigned to green, which are, you know, is like 51% these, but also includes some of these points because they're like 49 and 47 and 33% green and stuff like that. Maybe even some of these, but at like 0. 0.00001%, right? So it, everything, everything gets a probabilistic weight. We're gonna recalculate the mean of the weighted assignments, okay? Uh, okay, so I, I wrote that. It colors according to the highest probability. Uh, and so we recalculate the mean and the variance, okay? And, uh, and this is what we get. And so now you start to see, <clears throat> like look at this point right here, okay? This point right here, okay? According to k-means clustering, Euclidean distance, this would never happen, where this point gets classified as black instead of green, even though the centroid is right here, because, um, but, it can happen with the EM algorithm because, according to the rules of um, uh, when we recalculated the kind of the weighted variance matrix, it says, okay, it recognized that this centroid center cluster has a very high variance and says, okay, the probability of being out here is not that weird, okay? It's not that unusual because it's super far away, but with a high variance, it's not that unusual to be out there, okay? Whereas this thing has a very small variance, so it's very unusual to be um, far away. Okay, and so we, we do this, and uh, and we iterate again, and we can see the the things starting to move. So this shifts down a bit, and it's coloring a little bit more. And again, these are like fifty one percent and forty nine percent if they're on the border of belonging to one cluster or the other. And so they are getting still factored in to the calculation of the centroids here. And, uh, and it colors it accordingly. And, and they keep going, and this is what we end up getting. Okay? And so, so all of these points, and you can see, 
these get clustered uh, to this thing, and these ones get clustered over here. Um, and this looks, I think, pretty good, right? It looks pretty good. Okay, and these were the uh, the original assignments. Okay, the don't worry about this color switching from green to red. It's just uh, those are arbitrary things. But these points all got uh, in the original data when we generated it. It came from here and came from here. Now, obviously, when we cluster them, it doesn't. It's not going to know. Okay, according to the clustering, these points, these two black points here, are more similar to this cluster over here, and so they all get clustered. To, clustered the same, but I think that's a that's a reasonable conclusion, right? Um, and so this, again, the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixtures takes into account the fact that we can have um, components with, a, you know, a very high probability uh, of being assigned to one um, and, a, and having a very high variance here to, uh, to go, go like that. Is that okay? Um, okay, so this is the originals. All right, now if you start off with some bad uh, locations, okay, so here I start with these uh, starting points, okay, and um, um, and if we do this, it struggles, okay. Um, so this is this is where it ends up. It ends up finding this in the end, okay? But it, it couldn't figure this out as another cluster, and it just says this is another cluster here, okay? Um, so um, you know, you can get different results from uh, depending on where your uh, initial uh, assignments are, okay? Uh, I feel like this is forgivable because again, when you don't know the original data. I think this cluster is very easy to pick out. This cluster is a little bit harder, right? This cluster is a little bit more subtle to uh, to pick out. Okay, so um, so we were able to get it here, okay, but uh, but we didn't get it over here. Is that all right? The EM algorithm. Okay, I'm gonna I'll post up some notes, and um, you will have an exercise to uh, to code it. Um, to code it up, okay, and that will be part of your your homework five. Yeah, question. So on the formal work, the beginning point is given, or we we'll take it out. Yeah, so I I will have some uh, data generated for you guys, and uh, and you'll be able to um, uh, to go from there. Okay, uh, here let me just kind of let me look up and connect. EM algorithm. No edit. All right. So here's a illustration, okay, and and it's identifying clusters in uh, in this two-dimensional space here. Um, I think the results are a little bit more pronounced for uh, this for this diagram, okay. So here is uh, Okay, um, if you use k-means clustering on these data points here, okay, because it uses Euclidean distance, the uh, clustering ends up going bad. Okay, I think you, your homework assignment is basically this. All right, it's gonna your your data is gonna look like this. I'm gonna ask you to do k-means clustering. You got to write your k-means clustering algorithm, uh, and it's gonna it's gonna do a bad job. Okay, for on this data set, with the EM algorithm. 
again, it's able to take into account the, um, the variance covariance matrix. And so it can say this cluster is centered here, but it has a very high variance. So points like out here or out here could belong to the center cluster, okay? Even though distance-wise, this point is closer to this cluster, okay? It says probabilistically, it's more likely to belong to this cluster um, rather than this one, okay? And over here, because the variance is so small and saying um, we're expecting a small amount of spread, um, this point right here is, is very unlikely to belong to the red cluster here. Okay. Question? So like for even clustering, if you're doing it in real life, it's recommended that we eyeball the data first so we could pick a good starting location? I mean, if you're able to, yeah. If you're able to eyeball things and if you have a general sense of where to start, it's always a good idea. Um, but it's, it's often hard, right? And if your dimension is like 80 dimensions, it's hard to know, it's hard to eyeball that, right? I don't even know how to graph that. But, but if, if you have a sense, right? Okay, maybe we're going to get clusters based on gender or something like that, okay? I don't know. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, right? Um, but you might say, okay, well, it might make sense. Like for a starting point, let's try generic woman stats over here and generic man stats over here, right? And, and you can start start your algorithm there to, to see, and maybe it will uh, do, or maybe not, okay? And you might probably want to just start off with a few different things, right? Because uh, as we saw, you know, your starting points could, not always, but could have an effect on the thing. And so if you said, well, I'm starting off, I think there's going to be clusters based on gender, and you start with those initial assignments, the data might end up confirming your initial kind of preconceived notions and biases, right? Um, and you can say, well, um, you know what, let's just try doing some different arbitrary clustering. And if you get the same results where it clusters by gender, then, then that supports your original case or the theory. But if you get completely different results, then you say, well, my, my data is quite sensitive to my starting locations and stuff. Yeah. OK, Yoni, question. Yes. Uh, well, I don't want to say that's the only difference. Okay. The EM algorithm is a, a lot more of a general algorithm and doesn't necessarily have to apply to this this thing. Okay. Uh, I would say the biggest differences, okay, is that the k-means clustering has only one way to measure similarity, and that is Euclidean distance, okay? And it could be Euclidean distance in two dimensions or Euclidean distance in some higher projected plane if you're using a kernel function. But it's using this distance uh, as a, as a me metric for what is similar and dissimilar. The EM algorithm takes into account a probability distribution, like a PDF. And in our case, we're using the Gaussian PDF to say dots that are close to the center of the ellipse are likely, dots that are far away from the center of the ellipse are less likely, you know, depending on kind of the way the ellipses are drawn, right? And so the EM algorithm takes into account the probability distribution, which is able to draw different shaped ellipses, right? It can draw um, so k-means can only draw circles because it's Euclidean distance. So it's the contour lines for k-means are just circles centered at the centroid. Uh, EM algorithm is able to draw um, ellipses pointing in different directions and also with kind of different spacings out, right? So it can say um, for this cluster, um, everything is very tight together and so um, you know kind of your 99 percent boundary is way uh, is is this small circle whereas over this cluster the 99 percent boundary is super far out okay yeah no it's not it's using distance right and so k means as far as like if you're talking about which um, uh, which centroid is closer, 
you're basically drawing um, a circle centered at each centroid and which um, you know the dot that falls in the nearer circle uh, get, gets assigned to uh, to that cluster, right? Okay, so basically, am I, am I right in saying that EM is just a matrix based on how close it is to the centroid? It's not just distance, though. It's based on a prob probabilistic assignment. So the EM uses a weight matrix, okay? But those weight matrices are calculated using probabilistic assignments using the PDF. So if, if so, uh, do, uh, you have to think back to the Bayes classifier. Okay, it's it, it, I would say the EM algorithm is a lot easier to understand if you think of it as a Bayes classifier. Okay, uh, in this iterative applied in an iterative fashion, like k-means. So k-means is iterative in that you recalculate centers and recalculate uh, re redo assignments, and the EM algorithm is iterative in the same way that you recalculate the centers, which are going to be the means and the variances, and then you recalculate the assignments, which are now probabilistic assignments using the Bayes classifier. Using how far it is from the mean or It's not a distance thing. It's, it's a probabilistic. What is the probabilistic? It's based on the PDFs. So, so, so if you remember the, uh, so in your homework, you had to classify whether a certain observation is more likely to be Satosa or Virginica or Versicolor, right? Now, how did you get those probabilistic assignments? With the data that I had. Right, but, and, but those, how did you plug in the data to get your probability assignments? You didn't use a distance matrix, you used a PDF, right? You used the normal PDF, and that's what we're doing. We're using a normal PDF. The point is that I have data. Yeah, of course, you're going to have data here. Something is missing from this, in my understanding, that I have there previously. I don't really know how to put it in better words, but I'm pretty sure they're right about it. Right? Well, I, I don't know what's going on in your brain, so I don't know how to answer your question. But we are using a probabilistic assignment, OK? Um, and if, if we understand how the Bayes classifier gets probabilities, then we can understand where the weights are coming from in the EM algorithm. And the weights are going to power which, who gets assigned where. And it's again, it's a probabilistic assignment, not a direct assignment. And the weights are used to then calculate the, the centers and the variances. Okay. So you yes. Okay, um, uh, this is a lot, this is the generalized form, okay? Oh, no, no, this is, oh, this is for the uh, normal density. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you, Wikipedia makes, I think, makes it a, a little bit harder <laughs> sometimes. Okay, I love Wikipedia, but in this case, um, maybe they overemphasize the, the mathematical notation. And I think uh, just having a conceptual understanding of how these probabilistic assignments go uh, will be easier. Um, let's see. OK, I guess I can start talking about what I'm thinking of putting on the final, OK? And I haven't fully decided yet, OK? so. Um, Um, okay, so one, we talked, uh, um, sorry, let me, uh, let me pull up my notes on what I'm doing for the final before I start going off and telling you what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. Are you going to get the study guide back in the class? Yeah, kind of like that, okay? But uh, but I'll just start saying things out loud now so you can um, start thinking through, okay? All right, So, uh, but I'll flesh all of these out in a little bit more 
detail so you can start um, start thinking through. Okay, so anyway, well, let me just say, all right, so Monday we'll, uh, I guess, uh, more detail on the final, all right? And then I will cover PCA, okay? And um, as far as the final exam goes, you will only be expected to have a conceptual understanding of PCA. Uh, and so that's what, that will be that, okay? And so it breaks my heart a little bit, but you know, we just don't have time for... I don't think it would be fair to cover PCA in full depth on Monday and then have you tell it all back to me two days later, okay? Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's fair, but I don't know, but I won't do it. Are you saying on principle having the part of the analysis? Try to make a joke. Okay, okay, sorry, yeah. Story of my life. Okay. Um, you want your, yeah, everybody wants their notes as early as possible. I get it. Okay, um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, all right? That's, that's all you can ask of me, all right? <laughs> okay, um, all right, so I'm thinking of doing a maximum likelihood Fisher information. Um, okay, and so I'll give you, um, I give you some PDF. Probably a univariate PDF. Okay, so I don't know. Possibilities. What are some univariate distributions? We've got um, by uh, Bernoulli, uh, Poisson, exponential. Um, okay, and then I guess. Uh, Bivariate possibilities. Um, uh, include binomial and normal. Okay. Now there's more. There's like gamma and stuff like that. But I, I won't. I won't do that. All right. If it's going to be binomial, a bivariate, I'll just keep it to either binomial or normal. What are what are some other normal PDF uh, univariate PDFs? Why can't I think of them? Univariate probability distributions. Don't don't give me any suggestions. I'm gonna find some the right. <laughs> List of probability distributions. There's a lot. Okay. <laughs> see. We have Bernoulli binomial, but these are, okay, with infinite support. Don't they have these organized nicely? semi intervert whole real line, variable support, joint distributions. All right. Well, okay. Where's their um Oh, uniform, of course. All right. All right, we'll keep it simple, all right? Um Wait, do we have a chance to know the PDF or like what we need to give it? No, I'll give you the PDF, all right? But you got to know how like the data works, right? Like, if it's the exponential distribution, what do the x values that come out of the exponential distribution mean? What are they symbolize? What, what, what kind of values can you get for exponential? Like, what's the support of the exponential distribution? You guys are going to graduate with degrees in statistics, <laughs> and you cannot tell me the support of the exponential distribution. 
from UCLA, no, no less, all right? All right. Uh, so exponential can produce any value zero or greater, right? Zero to infinity. Yeah, and, and it zero is the most probable, and it looks like this, OK? Right. Well, uh, what's the parameter? Oh, OK. Yeah, I guess some, some letter, OK? Lambda is usually the, uh, the letter we use, OK? Um, some letter, all right. But what is that letter? What is that letter? The rate, right? OK. So if the rate is 5, what's your expected value? One fifth, yeah, yeah, okay. And what does that represent? It represents the time between events, right? If your thing is exponential, if your rate is five events per block of time, so like five events per hour, what's the average time between events? It's going to be one fifth of an hour, okay? Yeah, you guys are crushing my heart here, all right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to ask forgiveness from me, just yourselves, all right. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, all right, uh, maybe, but um, okay, so anyway, uh, I'll give you some function, all right? I'll give you some data, right? So I might be like, uh, so if it were exponential, uh, I might say like, okay, um, the first event happened, uh, you know, the waiting time was 30 minutes, or maybe like 0.5 hours, and uh, 1.2 hours, and then 0.1 hours between events, right? Because it's like, how long did you have to wait between customers coming into your window or something like that, right? And then, and then based on that, what is the maximum likelihood estimate for the rate parameter? Which is easy. Okay. Okay. So anyway, and then and then I'll ask for like bay, uh, the Fisher information related to that. Okay. Um, we can do a Bayes classifier problem. Bayes classifier. Um, Probably I'll keep it to uh, like a binomial, binomial PDF, or a normal PDF. I think those are uh, binomial PDF or normal PDF, right? So um, for the likelihood, and then the prior will just be kind of you know your proportion in the training data. All right. And then I'll give you some some test case. And you tell me the Bayes probabilities. Bayes classifier probabilities. All right, here we'll do, I'll just do a very quick example problem, all right? I'm, I'm making this up on the fly here, all right? So I, I could give you like data, maybe uh, five people, okay? And we will say, uh, we'll do um, male, and this person is uh, 70 inches, and then we've got male, uh, 72 inches, and female, uh, 65 inches, female, 62 inches, female, uh, I don't know, 69 inches. OK. And then test point, uh, new person. Person is 
68 inches tall. What is the base classifier probability of the uh, person? Let's let's. I'm going to just increase it to 73 inches here. Okay, and then we'll say uh, use sample mean and sample SD for MLE uh, for your estimates. Okay, can we do this? That would be like a normal distribution problem. Okay. Um, and I would provide the normal PDF for you guys, okay? Um, this might be a little tedious to calculate the standard deviation. Maybe I'll be nice and give you the standard deviation. I don't know. But if you have to calculate the standard deviation of three numbers, you should be able to do that, right? Okay, uh, or if it's binomial, Um, I'll say like um, 10 bags from factory A, 5 from factory B, five factory C. okay. Why is this auto completing everything? Stop. Okay. Um, and then we'll say um, factory A bags are, I don't know, 10%, 10% blue. I'm making this up. Factory B is 20% blue. Factory C is 30% blue. Okay. And then, all right, test bag. 15% blue. Uh, we'll say um, let's, uh, 50 pieces and 30, wait, uh, no, 15%. How do we get 15%? I don't know. Uh, all right, 20, 20 pieces. And three are blue. Okay. All right. Give me base classifier probabilities. I don't know. Something like that, right? Um. Maybe um, <clears throat> canon classifier. Um, I provide some test data or training data. Sorry. Okay, I'll provide some training data, and then uh, I provide a test point, and you tell me the classification if k equals 1, k equals 3. Provide some training data with, we'll say, two classes. Okay, so this will be like a list of points and labels. And then, you know, k equals 5, k equals 7, something like that. I think that's easy. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how else you do it. Yeah. Huh? I mean, I can provide the distance formula, but I'm not gonna. If I provide the distances and the like, that trivializes the problem. Okay. 
Um, I mean, maybe you can just graph it. Maybe I'll provide a grid for you to graph the data points on. Okay, then it's easier, right? You bring a ruler, you don't even have to calculate the distance. You just measure the distance yourself. <laughs> I mean, that's really what you're doing, okay? Um, we can do k-means clustering. Uh, again, I provide some unlabeled data, right? In two dimensions. I'll, I'll flesh all of this out in, in greater detail and post all of this. Uh, so I'll provide some unlabeled data in two dimensions, and then um, maybe I'll provide some random initial assignments. And then I'll ask you to do a few, maybe one or two full iterations of k-means clustering. Okay, this is all you need to do, have, right? You just need some unlabeled data and some random initial assignments, and then you can do two full iterations, right? So one would, part one would be find the centroids of current assignments. And then part two would be update assignments. debating this one. Um, the Finding the kernel function distances manually is kind of hard, but if I keep, if I use a simple transformation function, so maybe I, I provide a simple um, 2D to 3D transformation function. Um, I provide a few, a small, like three or four point data set in 2D. And then I ask you to cluster the data using the transformations. Transfer transformed points. Yeah, question. It's not like I haven't done MLU before, but I feel like we never did much in this class, so I guess I can go back to drawing. Really what I'm hoping for, is there any chance you can give us like a practice test? I feel like I'm not gonna give you a practice test. This is I'm I'm detailing out what I'm what I expect you to learn, okay? I'm not gonna give you uh, actual practice problems. Every time when I've done that in the past, I always got complaints. The real test was nothing like the practice test. Of course not. What, what did you expect? Okay. So, um, so I'm telling you uh, what the problems will be like, and you have to study what this is. But I, uh, every time I've listed this out, I always felt like the test lined up with. I mean, I, of course, I'm going to feel that way, but um, I feel like the exams line up with what I've described. Okay. Now. It might not have lined up with what you thought you would see, but if you go back and you read my description, I feel like my description fits what what is seen. Yeah. So I feel like my only option is to make my own practice test and show it to you and see if my doctor is wrong. Uh, well, I think that's good. Making your own practice test. I will not tell you if your practice test looks like my practice test no, or my real test, but. That's the problem. Like, 
yeah. So, um, so in the past, and and I was, and I thought this was great. Uh, in the past, students on um, Campus Wire created practice questions, and then um, would answer them and compare answers and things like that. Okay, and and I think that's great. I think. If you guys can each kind of come up with your interpretation of what I've said here and come up with some kind of practice problem. And when you create, um, so anyway, I mean, if you go through the process of thinking up a problem, you recognize like what you need to know, what you what to look for in, in making this. And I have to say, you know, the student who made up a whole bunch of these problems, he aced the final. He got a hundred last quarter. So. Uh, which I, you know, I was not surprised because it was very clear that he prepared himself very well for the the exam. I, I, I could have predicted he was going to get a very high grade um, based on what he was <laughs> saying on Campus Wire. You know, um, yeah. Okay. I mean, the hardest part's always the hardest part to predict is the conceptual stuff, right? The conceptual questions. There's always some kind of curveball in there. Um, so anyway, so k means with a kernel. So I'll provide some 2D to 3D transformation function. I'll provide a small data set in two dimensions. I cl uh, and then I'll ask you to cluster the data using the transform points. So that means you got to transform it, right? So, so you will transform the points. Um, I guess um, I will also provide initial. Um, cluster assignments. Okay, so you transform the points, you find the centroids of the transformed data, and then you reassign using Euclidean distance. Okay, um, and then in, I think I'll throw in an EM algorithm problem. Um, so I will uh, probably a very small data set, very small. Not a very okay. A small. I'll probably stick with a unidimensional data set. Okay, to kind of keep things simple. Um, I'll provide a normal PDF. Sorry, we're going over the time here. Um, I'll provide the um, quote most recent iterations. So, because uh, I'm going to basically ask you to do one iteration, but we're going to kind of pretend that in the most recent iteration, uh, most recent iterations kind of uh, mean and sigma values uh, for each cluster. So it'll be like cluster one has mean equal to three and sigma equal to two and Cluster two has mean equal to six and sigma equal to two or something, right? And then I want you to recalculate um, the weights of each point. So this is going to basically be a base classifier. And then recalculate the uh, probably weighted uh, central centers means. I probably will not ask you to do the weighted standard deviations. I'll be nice about it. Okay, but you know you'll have to recalculate the the weights of each point, which very similar base classifier and you'll recalculate the weighted means. Does that kind of make sense? And then of course, 
my favorite conceptual questions. Of which one of them will be PCA, okay? And other topics. Well, conceptual will involve like treating it as well. Maybe, yeah. Okay, so we'll say conceptual questions that span the entire course, all right? So uh, as far as the all of this stuff, this is all post-midterm. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll flesh all of this out uh, in greater detail, and I'll post post that document up on CCLA. Okay, and then uh, and you can expect to see uh, homework five up, and I'll make that due after the final exam, and, uh, and we'll see uh, see you on Monday. Have a good week.